Welcome to John Gates Games. This is my variety vlog for May 2017, and as you can see, there are a bunch of different topics I'll be covering in this video, including a one-off segment that was suggested by a viewer, where I'll be going over my impressions of Board Game Geek's current top 20 games. So feel free to skip ahead to the part that most interests you, or stick around for the whole thing. Let's start things off with general updates for the channel, and as always, a super brief Patreon update. There were five new pledges to the campaign over this last month, and for the second time, somebody asked me if they could do a PayPal donation instead of a recurring thing through Patreon. So I went ahead and made a donate button. Uh, right now, the only link to it is a tiny little P in the top right corner of the main page for John Gates Games. I'm not sure how prevalent I want to be scattering this throughout my content because I don't want to seem like I'm just constantly begging for money, but either way, I'm really appreciating all the support that the channel's been getting. And now for the main channel update, I simply want to say thank you for bearing with me over this last month where I feel like the overall quantity and quality of the channel kind of slipped a little bit as I was trying to do videos at the same time as doing one of the bigger shows that I've done in years. In fact, it was a four and a half week straight show that I was setting up and I was managing it. I haven't done something this big in four years, so not since I actually started this channel. And since I was managing this show, it was very mentally taxing and also very physically taxing because I have a uh, sort of a physical job where I'm constantly climbing up and down ladders. I'm carrying heavy things from one spot to another as we're installing lights and power distribution for these gigantic shows that we do for my main job. And I found that every day when I got home from work, I all I could really do was eat dinner and just try to relax. I was hoping at the beginning of the stretch to actually be able to film some stuff at night and then edit it um, over the next few nights, but I found that happened uh, nowhere near as much as I wanted to. I suppose I did get out five videos over the last month, which seems like a ton when you consider for the first year or so of the channel, I was only doing two to three, but for now, I kind of want to be doing more than that on average, and I feel like I'm looking forward to having a lot more time off getting back to my regular uh, schedule with work. Uh, that show finished yesterday. This is the first day off I've had in the middle of a week in many weeks. I had a couple in the beginning of this month, and that's the only reason I was able to get things out like the Yokohama playthrough video. So there is uh, a reasonable amount of uh, spare time for me coming up soon. I'm hoping to do a lot more videos, and there are some pretty cool stuff on my list of things I'll be covering over the next couple months here. At this point, I would usually do some questions and answers, and I will be covering them after this segment, but I got a question from viewer FuhrenKazen88, and they wanted to know my opinions on the top 20 games on BoardGameGeek, because they were just curious about my thoughts on them, and I figured that sounded kind of fun for a one-shot segment, so let's go ahead and jump right into it. The uh, number 20 game currently on BGG is Mansions of Madness 2nd Edition, and I've never played any of the Mansions of Madness games. Uh, I believe this is kind of a mansion crawl where you're going around a house, uh, unveiling new rooms and maybe fighting some monsters. I know that a big difference between the 1st and 2nd Edition is the 2nd one has uh, app support where you need to be using an iPad or something like that to help you go along. I've never been too particularly interested in this game for one reason or another. I just felt like maybe there's just a bit too much going on and it doesn't really play to my wheelhouse of usually liking card games or like Euro games. So uh, I don't see myself ever actually getting this one, but I think if a friend had a copy, I would certainly be interested in trying it out at some point. The uh, number uh, 19 game is Great Western Trail. That got out there really quickly. It came out at Essen last year and I uh, did a full playthrough and I actually did a review so if you want to hear my extended thoughts on Great Western Trail, it was uh, a little bit uh, divisive. There were quite a few people who thought I was um, a bit off the mark because it did not really work out that well for me and for pretty much everyone I played it with. I think only one person who I played it with was interested in continuing to play it. It's a uh, heavy Euro-style game where you are herding cattle and moving your little uh, one worker throughout a rondelle, essentially a loop, and every time you go through the loop, you will potentially be doing things slightly differently because new things get added into that loop. And um, for a myriad of reasons, it was uh, quite a long review. I it, it ultimately disappointed me, and I'm not going to really go into them right now, but if you're curious, definitely check out the review for that one. Uh, number 18 is Star Wars Imperial Assault, and I have not played this one, but I played a lot of Descent 1.0 and Descent 2.0, which also came out from Fantasy Flight Games, and it seems like this is just Star Wars, um, uh, a Star Wars uh, theme put onto the Descent uh, mechanism, and so I think I would probably enjoy it because I did like Descent 1 and Descent 2, uh, but again, it didn't seem interesting enough for me to go out of my way to grab it. Also, I played a lot of Descent 1 and 2 uh, many years ago in my uh, board gaming um, uh, progress, actually, uh, through the hobby, and I found I am no longer quite as interested in dungeon crawls. Uh, I guess I'm kind of crazy about Gloomhaven right now. That's a bit of an exception. So dungeon crawls don't really attract me that much, and that's one of the reasons I haven't really done uh, anything with Imperial Assault at this point. Now we've got 
Number 17, which is Through the Ages, A Story of Civilization, and this is technically the first version of the game. Um, I will talk a little bit more uh, about this a little bit later when we get to the second version, which is also on this list. So now we have 16, which is Blood Rage. This came out a couple years ago, and I'm not usually crazy about dudes on a map style games. And in this one, from what I understand, because I haven't played it, you uh, play as a bunch of Viking clans. There is hand drafting where you have hand of cards. You pull one out and you pass it to the next player. And these cards can be like mythical beasts and all sorts of various powerful actions as you are moving your dudes around on this map and trying to fight each other all over the place. I believe that when your Vikings actually get killed, they go to Ragnarok, and that's not necessarily a bad thing, which is kind of a neat twist on fighting dudes on a map style games, but ultimately I'm just not very compelled by games where I have to take territory and fight with units and different types of units. That stuff doesn't really do much for me. Again, I think I would like to try this one at some point just to have that feather on my cap, just know, to know what Blood Rage actually plays like because so many people are interested in it. But um, this is going to be one I'm going to maybe try at a board game cafe or something like that. I'm never going to be seeking this one out. Let's see. Now we have 15. This is Mage Knight, the board game. Uh, this is this was designed by Vlada Shavatel, and I have not played it, but I know that it is a massive uh, deck building game. Well, I guess realistically, it's an adventure game that can be played competitively and cooperatively uh, with a really big map, and you're moving uh, people around the map. There's lots of scenarios, and there is a deck building mechanism that is in there. But from what I've heard, you don't actually cycle through your deck very much in this game. Like maybe like two to three times over this game, which I've also heard can be like six to seven hours long. Uh, so this is one of the main reasons I've never actually played it. I actually had an opportunity a couple of years ago at a convention to try it with a friend, but ultimately decided I was more interested in playing like three other games instead. And uh, he played it with somebody else and they never even finished the game. It was like six and a half hours later and they had to leave for something, for some reason or another. And so they never actually got to complete that one um, uh, campaign, uh, not campaign, but uh, scenario. And so I think at some point I'd be interested in giving this a shot because it just seems like uh, an interesting challenge to overcome, but it would not surprise me if I never actually get around to this one. Now we have Agricola at 14, and I actually talked about this one uh, a little bit, I think in the last variety vlog. I've only played this one once. It was about eight or nine years ago. I had a pretty rough uh, go of it because I was very new to board games at the time. I don't think it was taught to me terribly well, and I just didn't enjoy it all that much. This is a worker placement style game where you are grabbing um, you're, you're building fences, you're building little pieces to your house, you're um, making new people that you can use and also getting lots of different livestock. And it was number one on BoardGameGeek for years. So I figure at some point I've got to come back to this one and try it again. Uh, I am actually actively interested in playing this one at some point. I want to make this one happen. It um, can be a little bit hard to play older games when there's so much new stuff coming out, but I do want to give this one a shot. And uh, when I do, believe me, I will talk about it in the variety vlog of the month I play it because I'm sure I'll have some things I want to say about it. Uh, now we have number 13, which is War of the Ring 2nd Edition. Well, this is a big dudes on a map style game it's set in the Lords of the Ring universe. It's two player only. One side is on the uh, on the side of uh, Sauron and the other side is on the the, for, uh, the forces of, of good and Frodo and all that stuff. I don't know much about this game. I've never really looked into it too much. I know that it had like a $400 special edition. Uh, that might actually be what this one is. Um, so I can't speak to this game too much, but it's dudes on a map fighting on this really epic scale. It's just not something that appeals to me at all. I would... I don't think I'm actually interested in trying this one. I think if someone came up to me with it and said, you've got to try War of the Ring, I would most likely try to convince them to play something else because this just really doesn't play to my particular interests. Uh, now we have Puerto Rico at number 12. And I had a copy of this for years. I actually had the uh, Treasure Chest mini expansions, uh, which added some new buildings and whatnot, because in this game, it has a really great action selection me mechanic that I think many other games have used subsequently. I'm not sure if it was the first to do this or not, but there are like f uh, four or five different actions in the middle of the table. You choose one, and then you get to do it uh, at a bit of a discount or a bonus, then everybody else gets to do it as well, and then the next person goes, but there's a diminished pool of action options that you could take and once enough of them are gone you then reset bring the other ones back out again and then you put some money down on the ones that were not taken so over time even the worst spot or the worst action will get taken because money is just good to have in this game and you are cultivating plantations you're building buildings that let you break rules and do things uh, more interestingly you get to make some pretty cool combos and i did enjoy this game i've played it 
many times. I'm not sure how many because most of my plays were before I started logging games in 2010. So I enjoyed this game. I would totally play this one again. If somebody brought it over and said, hey, I want to play Puerto Rico, I'd, I'd be definitely down for it. Although I'd be most interested in playing with the expansion buildings and the uh, nobles, uh, workers that you can get that kind of vary things up a little bit. This is a, a classic to a whole lot of people. And while I don't necessarily think it is truly amazing, I've really enjoyed plays of it. I think it is certainly a good game. Uh, now we have number 11, The Castles of Burgundy. Um, <laughs> I've talked about this one uh, a couple different times. I used to own it. I've played it probably three or four times. Um, I could actually check that one up. Actually, if I look right here, ah, <laughs> it tells me right here I played it three times. <laughs> and I ended up uh, selling this one to a friend because I found after three plays, I was just not that interested in playing it anymore because what's going on here is every person gets a uh, little board that is unique to themselves. They're going to be putting all sorts of different colored hexes down on that board and these things will do a variety of stuff. They might score you for site collection if they're animals. They might get you bonus actions if they're castles. They might let, uh, let you break some of the rules with these special technology tiles that you put down and you acquire these by um, uh, uh, rolling dice and then doing a bit of dice worker placement or and or uh, dice action selection because you can use these work uh, dice in different ways and you put them out into the middle of the board and take some uh, hexes that you maybe want and now nobody else can grab those. There was just a lot of stuff going on. I enjoyed it, but the issue I had with it is just, I just never wanted to get it to the table again. I played it three times and I'm pretty sure when I finished that third game, I was like, wow, that was fun. And then like two years went by and I was never even motivated to pull it off of the, the shelf. And many of my friends did enjoy it. And one of my friends mentioned they were interested in buying a copy of their own. I said, no, 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 that's silly have my copy. I think I sold it to him for like 10 bucks or something like that. So it's still in the friend group. And honestly, I'm kind of interested in playing this one again. It's been so many years and I remember enjoying it. It just, for some reason, never actually excited me. So now we have the top 10. So the first one is Caverna, the Cave Farmers. And this is the sequel to Agricola. Uh, this time, instead of being farmers getting uh, cows and sheep, you are dwarves, like carving out uh, caves and also, I think harvesting fungus and stuff, I don't know much about uh, this one in particular. I think the main thing that I've heard as a criticism is every single time you play the game, I think the same buildings are out, so it allows people to do similar strategies, but I'm really not going to double down on that because I've never played this one, and I am interested in giving it a shot. In fact, I came this close to playing it at BGGCon last year uh, when I met Bill Corey Jr. Uh, I mentioned that I never played Caverna, and he said, you've got to play Caverna. We're going to play it at this convention. But later on in that conversation, I also mentioned that I was not very, I didn't really like Power Grid, and that changed everything. And he said, no, 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 you have to play Power Grid. We're going to play Power Grid, and I think I'm going to convert you into liking it. So we ended up playing Power Grid instead of Caverna. So who knows? Maybe next year I'll actually get Caverna played. I am interested in trying this one as well. Um, as Agricola that I mentioned before, I'd be interested in having a comparison between these two games, which I've effectively not played because that one play of Agricola was so long ago. Uh, now we have Seven Wonders Duel, and uh, I reviewed this one on the channel, and my views of it have not really changed too much. This is a two-player only version of Seven Wonders that uses table uh, pool drafting instead of hand drafting. So instead of having a hand of cards and you picking one and passing it to the next player, all the cards are out in the middle of the table. Some of them are face up, some of them are face down. You can only grab it certain ones that are face up, and once you grab these, your opponent can't get to them, and there are similar building restrictions to Seven Wonders, the main game, and I really quite enjoyed this game. I don't play two-player games uh, all that often, but this one comes out probably every four to seven months, I'd say, and every time I play it, I do enjoy it, although it's not one of those games that is, I'm, I'm super excited to play. It's just a solid gaming experience, and you know, I suppose for a good, uh, 45 ish minutes, uh, strategic game, it kind of makes sense that it's this high up on the list. It is a good one, although I think a big reason for it to be this high is because it is based on the Seven Wonders system, which was a humongously popular game. Uh, so now we've got number eight. Terraforming Mars. This is another one that came out last year. I believe it released at Gen Con. I did a review of this one, and my conclusion for the game was I really liked it. It is a uh, strong engine building game. It's uh, pretty much to its core. It's just multi-use cards with engine building going on like crazy. I guess, actually, I take it back. The cards really aren't multi-use. It's more that there are just tons of unique cards and you can play them down at the right moment to sometimes get a little bit of an engine going as well as just get one shot things. But each card can pretty much only be one thing when you play it down. And so it's more of a hand management engine building style game with tons going on. It definitely has a bit of an epic feel. It 
tended to go a little bit longer than I wanted. It seemed like most games were two to two and a half hours, and I would have preferred it to be more like hour 15, hour 30 on average, but I think potentially that could be house ruled. But either way, I've enjoyed every play of this, and I'll probably just be comfortable with knowing that it's a two hour game when I sit down to play this one again, because I do plan to play this one more. I still have it in my collection. I positively reviewed it. It's a really good game, although, it can be a little fiddly. There's a lot of stuff going on, a bit intimidating to look at the first uh, time you play it, but it's a pretty cool experience. Uh, now we have Scythe. This comes in at number seven. I played this one, well, let's see here. Um, I only have one log play of this, which I think is wrong. I've played this one, I think three times. I should go back into that. Once was online with my friends, um, Efka, Elaine, uh, Paul Grogan, and um, John Perkis, and then I played it uh, once as a full playthrough, and I did a video of that, and I played it definitely another time with some of my friends. So either way, I never actually reviewed this one, and I, I sold my copy somewhat recently because one of my friends has a copy and is way more into it than I am, and the main reason I did not review it is because I felt like I needed to play it more times to be able to grasp what was going on, to talk with any kind of authority on it. I feel like I didn't quite get the game enough, but the problem was I was not interested in playing it anymore. Uh, I would play Scythe again. It's not like I'm super anti-Scythe in any way. I just, it's it's kind of a dudes on a map style game. It has a Euro style thing going on because you have these uh, mechs that are kind of tromping around and potentially fighting each other, but you also have these citizens that are just trying to harvest fields and try to build buildings for the empire, uh, for your one empire. And it's, it's kind of a Euro um, meets war style game. And it feels almost like a Cold War game where it's all about posturing your military strength more than actually evaluating the conflicts. It seems like conflicts don't actually happen all that often in the uh, small data set of games that I've I've played this one. But like I said, I felt like for this one, there's so much going on. I wanted to play it at least one or two more times. And I just never found myself wanting to actually play it. And as kind of a rule for John Gets Games, I really try not to just play a game for the sake of being able to review it. I want to want to actually play it at least a little bit in order to make that worth it for me. And um, considering this is a couple hours long game and a lot of the people who are in my friend group are not also crazy about dudes on a map style games. It was not particularly easy to get it out. I feel like if one of my friends said, I really want to play this right now, and two people also said they did, I would have jumped in to have that extra experience to speak to it uh, from a review perspective, but that never actually happened. So who knows? Maybe someday I'll get around to reviewing it. But for now, I think it is a well-designed game. There's a lot of cool stuff going on there, but it was not really one that gave me much excitement. Up next, we have Star Wars Rebellion at number six. I played this game once. It is a game where one person plays the Empire, another person plays the Rebel Alliance. I played as the Empire, and my whole goal for the game was to try and find the hidden Rebel base and destroy it before a certain number of turns elapsed. And the Rebel player is obviously trying to keep their base hidden, and they're doing all these secret little missions that will actually reduce the number of turns that the overall game will go. So it's, it was kind of an interesting race. Uh, there was definitely a dudes on the map style thing going on here because you are constantly building these big armadas of fleets and you're flying them around. You're picking up ground troops from one planet and you're dropping them off somewhere else and you're trying to attack things and posture in a, a bunch of different spots on the board. It was kind of neat for in a cat and mouse style game where you're trying to hunt down that, uh, that planet. But I think the amount of combat heaviness that was going on here is really what dissuades me from really wanting to play this one again. I don't think I will be interested in playing this one again. Also, it was probably close to four hours long, and I would much rather play two to three other games with one person um, than sit down and play this one for that long. I just don't think this one played to my strengths that much. I know I'm a bit of a broken record here, but I just, I don't like moving fleets and of ships and dudes and all that kind of stuff around maps. It's not particularly interesting to me, and that is a big part of this game. Also, there is a ton of dice resolution of combat, which was kind of fun, but it was a bit extreme. I mean, I probably, I have no idea how many times I rolled dice, but it was a lot. And I like some variance when it comes to this kind of stuff. I'm not anti-dice when it comes to combat, but it was very combat heavy, which is not really my thing. Uh, so now we have Gloomhaven at number five. I mentioned it earlier. I hadn't looked ahead. I didn't realize it was that far up on this list. That's crazy. So this game is a dungeon crawl, and I take back everything that I said about Descent and not necessarily liking dungeon crawls because Gloomhaven has completely blown me away. I haven't done a review of this one yet, and I think I have 13 or so sessions of this played so far, or, or scenarios played, and I don't feel like I've played it enough. There are too many things that I need to unlock, like retiring characters. 
I haven't seen any characters get retired yet. I know there's this whole enhancement thing that has not been unlocked for our game just yet. And I'm still really interested in playing this game. I have another uh, session of it scheduled for next week. And I didn't play it much at all over this last month because things were so crazy. But this is one I want to continue playing because it has this persistent storyline with some tiny little legacy elements as you are unlocking things. It has this brilliant combat mechanic where you actually are able to um, pick uh, cards from your hand. It's hand management. Every card has two different, um, a top and a bottom, so two different uh, parts to it. And uh, on one card, you'll do the top part, and on the other card, you'll do the bottom part. And you can kind of mix and match all these cards that are in your hand. And every single character's uh, deck of cards is completely unique. And the game starts with, I think, six characters, and then you can unlock, like, 12 or 11 more characters. There's just so much going on in this box. There's like 40 different types of enemies with a really cool AI system. It's it's intimidating. The box weighs like 20 pounds. It's gigantic. It's not even up on my shelf. It's downstairs in the closet because it just takes up too much space to actually leave on the shelf. It is completely amazing. I think that it probably does deserve to be at the five spot on uh, Board Game Geek, and it would not surprise me if this one sneaks up even more once the uh, second printing of it goes live. There was just a Kickstarter campaign that finished like $200 shy of $4 million. And the first campaign was just around 350000 So it was, uh, you know, almost 10 times as big of a Kickstarter campaign, which means when that many people get a new version of the game, and I'm pretty sure they're all going to love it as well. I mean, no game is for everybody, but this game really seems to be working for a variety of different people. It's probably just going to keep going up. So we're probably going to be hearing about Gloomhaven for a long time, and I should probably stop talking about it. So next up, we have Terra Mystica at number four. I've played this one only one time, according to Board Game Geek. I feel like that's not true. I feel like I've played this one twice, but it has been a very long time. This one is a heavy style Euro game that takes um, some ideas from a variety of other games like Eclipse, where when you build uh, things off your player board, it then reveals bonuses for you and that can kind of track how good your empire is based off of how much stuff is not on your board. It also has some Settlers of Catan style stuff going on with the, um, the hexes that you're putting them out onto the main board. I guess most of the Settlers of Catan uh, analogy is because the pieces look so darn similar. But you're also trying to project control out on this map. And in this one, you're actually very much incentivized to build right next to your opponents because you get bonuses when they do things and you're next to them. But this game, it's a bit of a plate spinning game, if that makes sense, where you ever see those people who like have plates on sticks and they're kind of spinning all of them and they're constantly trying to keep all of them in the air? Well, that's what this game was to me. There's so many different things going on, like different subsystems. There's like a temple track over here, and then there are these uh, specific goals that you're trying to go for every single round. There's a magic system in addition to all of the buildings that you're building and putting out on the board. You have to terraform sp stuff when it's actually out on the board, and I'm pretty sure there's one or two other things that I'm forgetting here. And I enjoyed my plays of it, but I feel like it maybe had one more system that I really wanted going on there. Um, but I'm not going to speak too strongly about this because it's probably been four or five years since I played it. So I think I really would like to play this one again. It's been a long time and I remember enjoying it. Uh, so yeah, I should probably try and kick this one up the priority list of older style games that should be revisited. We've now reached the top three and at number three is Twilight Struggle. I have four logged plays of this one. And I bought this one a long time ago, like probably seven or eight years ago, back when it was still the number one game on Board Game Geek. And that was the main reason that I bought it. I was just falling off uh, the deep end into board gaming, and I figured I should try the number one game. I should own the number one game on Board Game Geek. So I got it, and I knew ahead of time that it was a two player only game that uh, simulates the Cold War between Russia and the United States. And I knew that it was about having influence and projecting influence and trying not to have the world end. But this is back before I really knew what my tastes were in games. And I vaguely remember having a hard time articulating why this one did not work out too well to me, even though I actually played this one four times. And I think a big part of that is because I'm not that crazy about area majority style games or dudes on a map. And this one kind of felt like a bit of both because as you're projecting this influence into all these different countries, you are going to be competing with your only opponent trying to wipe out their influence at the same time as you're putting influence down. And there is just a whole bunch of stuff going on here. And But the biggest problem that I had with the game was probably one of its greatest strengths, and that is its card play mechanism. It has this really awesome idea where you just have this deck of cards, and in it you have cards that are USA uh, good. They're, they're good for the USA. And you have also have cards that are really good for the USSR. And then there are, I believe, some cards in there that are neutral. 
And at the beginning of each round, you're going to deal out a hand of cards and you're going to look at your hand of cards and you might have dealt like five Russia cards and two USA cards and you're the USA. And you are suddenly in this terrible position because whenever you play one of those cards that is a Russia card, the uh, there's going to be a special event on it and the opponent gets to do the event. So by playing a card, they get to do something really awesome. It's really painful in that way, but also when you play the card, you probably get to project a little bit of influence around the board and do some little things. So this game is constantly about pain management. It's like you are always looking at a set of bad options and you're trying to pick the lesser of seven evils or something like that. So it's all about navigating this hand and figuring out the right moment to play a card that's good for your opponent because you want to play it when it is the least good as possible. So you want to kind of uh, arrange some certain situations for that. And of course, while you're doing this, they're probably doing it back to you. And so you get to do some pretty cool stuff on their turn. And while I think this mechanic is brilliant, it just turned me into a whiner. I just hated myself as I was playing this game. I just draw the cards and start complaining. And in my head, I'd have an inner dialogue. I'd be like, stop complaining, John, you're being annoying. But it still would just happen. This game just brought out the worst in me as a gamer. And I, I just figure I should not keep playing a game that makes me unhappy. And by proxy will probably make my opponent unhappy because it's always just one person. And I don't think anybody likes uh, playing a game with somebody who's just constantly whining. So I ended up uh, selling this one to a friend and I know it's been played a couple times since so I'm glad that people are enjoying this game I think it is a good game it just really wasn't for me uh, now we have number two through the ages a new story of civilization and once again I didn't actually look at this list before I started talking and that is super awesome to see it that high up uh, so I mentioned earlier back at I think number 17 uh, when Through the Ages A Story of Civilization came up. This is a new version of the original Through the Ages that came out in 20, uh, 2006. And it is a significantly different version of the game. I know there's a bit of controversy having this game pop up twice on the list in general, especially for a while both of them were in the top 10. But I think that's going to become less of an issue as time goes on because as you can see, Through the Ages, the original one, I think was at around five, and it's just slowly falling down as the new one is kind of continuing to go up. And I do think that A New Story is a significantly better game. They looked to over 100,000 games that were played online to try and streamline some of the mechanics, make some of the mechanics better, just uh, balance the cards. It is just a way better game. It's a civilization-style game without a map which obviously I am going to like because I don't really like maps. I don't like dudes on the maps. I just, I'm not crazy about having maps in games. So once you pull the map away and it's just purely abstracted to a, uh, a card game where you're building engines and you're trying to uh, do the best in several different ways and end the game with a bunch of victory points, I just love this game. And it completely replaced the original Through the Ages for me. So I, like I said, the controversy is going to be less of a thing. I wouldn't be surprised if in a couple of years, the first version of the game is like in the 30s and 40s. And if in... 20 years the game is like out of the top 100 because nobody's even going to talk about it anymore because the new version is so good and it is here at uh number two on board game geek uh i am a huge fan of this game i've played the new version eight times i played the old version close to 30 times and when you consider this game plays at about an hour 15 minutes per player at least for me and my group that is a humongous time investment in one single game it is just such a cool game um and as a funny anecdote i played it I think three times in the month of March this year, we kind of out of the blue, it got played so many times. And one of them I taught Jess, she had never played it before. And as she was, she was playing it, she, she enjoyed it. She actually beat me, which was, oh my gosh, I've played this game like 38 times and on her first play she beat me, but she's amazing at engine building games and games in general. But she was mentioning that all the mechanics that were going on in this game, like a big sliding card row, as well as some of the engine building and some of the resource management that you're doing, felt a little been there done that for her because she had never played this game before it came out in 20, uh, 2006 and so she's played lots of games that have borrowed and worked upon the ideas that were kind of pioneered by this game that came out way back then and she said she definitely respected what this game was and she actually really enjoyed it i wouldn't surprise me if she played this one again but it was just interesting to get her perspective where she's played all this newer stuff that is building on the foundations that's constructed by these older games. And she was kind of picking out all these different things and seeing how it was similar to this and similar to that. And it was just kind of a cool thing to see. Anyway, we've now reached number one. It is Pandemic Legacy Season 1, and this game is amazing. It is a legacy style game, which means you are permanently changing the game as you're playing it. And this one is a bit of a story-driven one where you're going to play it through uh, 12 months and you start in January, you end in December. You're going to spend um, up to two games per month. So you're going to play between 12 and 24 games of it. And there is a definite 
uh, narrative that happens. I, I liken this game to mixing uh, Pandemic with binge watching a show that just came out on Netflix because you are like so interested interested to see what's going to happen next because things get unlocked as time goes on and there is this narrative there is a story that emerges there is a couple there are a couple amazing spots that happen that just kind of like you're like oh my gosh I can't believe they did that and I'm obviously not going to spoil any of those things but I will say that the 18 games of this that I played at two players with Jessica controlling four different characters was uh, in total probably the best gaming experience I've ever had in my life, or at least top two to three. It was truly, absolutely amazing having that narrative happen. We played it over the course of probably actually about six months. It's just a really phenomenal game. You have the uh, Pandemic, which is a good cooperative game, which I enjoyed um, a decent amount, but I was never particularly excited about. But just having that story added on, having every single time you play it, essentially unlocking new little expansions to get new mechanics and having old stuff go away, new stuff happen, permanently affecting the board, having actual real emotions that um, get applied to the game. And it's not to an opponent, it's to a game because it's fully cooperative, was just really fascinating. We took like a month and a half break after one game because it was so heartbreaking that I was, I was, I was, I was mad. I was like actually mad. I could feel like my veins popping out of my neck as we were flipping over the last card and then it all went wrong and we lost and I was just, I was so emotionally invested. And to a certain extent, you know, I don't like being mad and I don't like being super stressed, but it's kind of amazing that this board game was able to evoke that kind of feeling, especially considering there's no timer. I feel like usually in order to get stress in games, especially fun type of stress, you need to have some real time aspects going on, but that wasn't going on here. Uh, season one was truly amazing. I am very much looking forward to seeing season two and uh, who knows, maybe in a year and a half or so, there'll be two pandemic legacies in the top 10 on Board Game Geek. So anyway, that was not quite as brief as I thought it would be, but that is my quick impressions of the top 20 games on Board Game Geek. And I hope you found it somewhat interesting. All right, it's now time to get to our regularly scheduled questions and answers segment. I'm only going to cover two of them right now. I got a whole bunch actually from uh, Andy Arduin, and I'll be doing two from him uh, this month and probably a, a few more of them in the uh, next month's Friday vlog. And the first one is pretty simple. He says, are you planning on coming to Essen this year? And yes, I am planning on doing that. I have a hotel room booked. I've never been to Germany before, let alone Essen. Uh, so I'm, I'm a little intimidated to go to the world's biggest board gaming convention, or certainly uh, the top two uh, biggest board gaming conventions, depending on the metrics that you're looking at. Um, it is in the, the end of October, and I am very excited. I, I'm looking forward to visiting Germany a little bit, although... I probably won't be um, staying too much longer than the actual convention itself. It's going to be probably some very expensive plane tickets, so I don't know if I'll be able to swing this every single year. Um, who knows? Maybe when I come back, I will actually have enjoyed it so much that I will want to. But the biggest reason for this is that so many games are released uh, at Essen, and so many games specific, particularly that are made by European publishers. And what I've found, uh, being a content creator, uh, obviously I'm trying to get review copies of games. I obviously buy a lot of games as well. But it seemed like for many of the European publishers, when I reached out to them about review copies, I often was told, well, we gave away all the review copies we wanted to at Essen. And so I kind of feel like if I want to actually catch some of this hype and play some of the new games, you know, sometimes three to six months before they actually hit America, I pretty much have to go to Essen. So it's a bit of a big experiment this year. It's a long way away from California, that's for sure. But I will definitely tell you guys all about it after that actually happens. And his second question is, are you planning to do uh, top 10 videos about favorite mechanisms or other things? And simply put, no, not really. The only top 10 video I've done was actually a top 20, and it was my top 20 games of all time as of, I believe it was like February of 2015 or 2016, I can't remember anymore. And to be honest, I kind of regret doing that video because it's such a snapshot of an opinion in a moment in time. And my opinions would be so different about many of those games. I've actually sold some of those games. Like if a game is my top 13 or something game of all time, I shouldn't be selling it a year later for something else. So I do kind of regret doing that one and I don't like how uh, fixed in time those things are. So I don't anticipate doing that. Uh, the only uh, top X kind of thing I see going forward is when I cover games at, that I played at conventions, well, that uh, snapshot in time is totally fine when I'm talking about these are the best 10 games I played in order at BGGCon or something like that. So you'll continue to see those type of things. But for now, I'm not particularly interested in doing any more top 10s. That wraps up questions for this month. If you have any you'd like me to answer in an upcoming variety vlog, please shoot those over to johngetsgames at gmail.com and I will eventually get to them.
Let's now move into the next section, which is games of note. And these are all the games that I played over the last month that were either new to me or a, were a particularly interesting play of that game for one reason or another. I have organized them uh, in order from games I like the most to the games I like the least over the last month. But uh, as a spoiler, I enjoyed all of these games to a certain degree. So let's go ahead and start at the top with Unlock. And as you can see, I have the European version here because it has the three different campaigns in one box. And they have not actually uh, released the US version just yet. And I wasn't able to get a good read on when that was actually going to happen. And I just really wanted to play these games. But more importantly, my wife Jessica really, really wanted to play these games. Uh, she she mentioned to me, she's like, why haven't you bothered getting it from Europe? And I was like, ah, you know, waiting. I have some store credit. And she's like, just get the games from Europe. We've got to play these games because she loves uh, puzzle hunt type of uh, things. She's amazing at puzzles in general. So anyway, I reached out and I bought it off of Amazon.de and we played all three sessions of this in one night. So this is a um, escape the room style game where you and your friends, it's fully cooperative, are trying to get out of the specific scenario. And this box has three different scenarios in it. And the uh, the scope of what you're trying to do is you're trying to get to the end in all three of them. And I'm not going to do any spoilers here, but there are some interesting tweaks and differences there. And the rule set is relatively uh, small. The entire game is encapsulated in a single deck of cards. And as you uh, pull the cards from the top of the deck, you will be continuing to find new things. And if you have a little card that has a little uh, keyboard on it, for instance, that has a little seven on it, then that means you can find card number seven in the deck and put that out onto the board. And then you could do things like combining the um, keyboard with the computer. And then you, when, when you do that, this is actually not spoilers. This isn't in any of these things. But if you had the keyboard, which was a seven, and then you had a computer that was a 10, then you would add the seven plus the 10 to get 17. And you would look into the deck and try to find a 17 card, which you'd flip over and hopefully be a computer that you could actually type things into. So that's the main mechanic for all of these games. But as I said, there are some kind of interesting tweaks going on here. And not only are you trying to um, smash items together to figure out what, what you're going to do, you also need to kind of hunt around because sometimes there are hidden uh, numbers that on some of the cards. And I will say that we had a really good time with this. We played uh, four players. Um, each scenario is supposed to take an hour. You kind of set a timer. Uh, and I'll say that we went over uh, the first scenario. We went like five minutes over, although it was a little bit frustrating. There was just a hidden thing that we just missed for like 15 minutes. We we're just spinning our wheels. Uh, and the second one, we beat it with probably 15 or so minutes to spare. And with the third one, we were, again, probably like seven, eight minutes off. And I don't want to say too much more about any of these specific scenarios, but I will say that we really enjoyed it. They were really fun. I would recommend you play it with four players and not less. And I also recommend you just sit down and you play all three of them in one evening. Uh, don't try and spread this one out over multiple sessions because they kind of ramp into each other in terms of complexity. And I feel like if you play one and then don't play the game for a month and come back to two, you're gonna have less fun than if you just play one and then immediately go into two feeling like you have a better grasp on everything that's going on there. So yeah, super fun and also non-destructive. So while I am done with this version of the game, I can now pass this on to friends and they can play it. I already have uh, one friend who's played it with their whole group and it wouldn't surprise me if this one leaves my collection at some point relatively soon to just go on a, a travel between uh, different people going on and having people just really enjoy playing this game. Uh, we had fun and I'm very much looking forward to seeing new content come out for this one. The second game of note is number nine or NMBR nine. And this one I also got from amazon.de. In fact, that one is over here. And uh, this one is a really simple game where you're trying to stack little tiles that are in the shape of numbers on top of each other. And in fact, I can show you right now, of course, it gets kind of messed up when you put it on the shelf. But when you look at what you have in the boxes, you have this insert with all these different numbers and they have different shapes like the six kind of looks like a six and the seven kind of looks like a seven. And what you're going to do is completely simultaneously and um, uh, with zero interaction between the players, you're going to be drawing cards from this little deck here. And the order in which you pull out the card numbers is the order in which you're going to be putting these cards down into a stack tableau in front of you. And you are going to score points for the numbers themselves, which is a really neat twist because that means if um, you have a number on a number tile on the very ground floor, it actually scores at zero um, points. But if you have it on the uh, first four, if you start stacking them on top of each other, then let seven will be worth seven points. But if you get a seven on the next level up, it's now worth 14 points and you keep multiplying these up. So the goal of the game 
is to build out these nice cohesive structures because you're never allowed to put a tile on top of another one such that there's like a hole underneath it. So it's a spatial game of a little bit of math, just trying to get as high as possible because you know you get that higher and higher multiplier. Odds are good the person who gets the highest and places the biggest number up there is probably gonna be the one to win it. And it plays in like 15 minutes if you're playing slowly, probably. The first time I played this was with Annette, who is Netters Plays on Twitter. Uh, she got a copy of it from uh, from Europe, and we played it once, and I really liked it so much that I went out and bought my own copy. I think maybe around the same time I got Unlock. I'm not exactly sure if that was the same shipment. And then I got that one in, and I played it twice with Jessica in a row. And we, uh, I just really like this game. Uh, Jessica liked it okay, but she's not crazy about tile laying games in general, but she saw the fun here, and I I like this one. I could see myself busting this one out to play as a filler in a lot of different circumstances because it does play so well, and it's got this neat tactile nature as you're actually stacking these tiles on top of each other. At the moment, the only real criticism I have is, is a two-sided thing, and that's the size of this box. You know, for a game that plays in like 10 to 15 minutes, it's a really big box. But then again, this insert is kind of nice. You put it in the middle of the table, and you actually pull the different numbers out as you're playing it. So I kind of was thinking the box would be smaller because the game is light, but I think that's not necessarily a correlation that should always be there. So either way, number nine is a super cool game, and I'm looking forward to playing this one more. I don't think it's got crazy depth, but it is a wonderful filler. In game number three, we now have Railroad Revolution, which is certainly not new. In fact, I put out a review for this game several months ago, and I liked this game, but I really wanted to love it. But there were a couple things that were holding it back, and subsequently, some of those suggestions that I had were also made by some other people online, and they became official variants to the game, which is kind of interesting. And lots of people have asked me for my opinion of the game now that some of uh, the ideas that I had and other uh, people who are critical of the game had, uh, what kind of effect that had on my play of the game. And I was able to finally get another play of it, this time with these variants going on. And I will say that I enjoyed it more. So I'm not going to go into the details of the nitty gritty of this game, but it is a uh, action selection style game where you have different colored workers and the color of the worker that you use on an action is going to evaluate special bonuses. So this game is all about getting combos and it seemed like there were uh, a couple different ways you could play the game and one of them would consistently get you really good amounts of points but it was brain dead and just not fun to play. It was the Western Union strategy and I didn't like how um, competitive it was. Like I don't want this thing that has almost zero player interaction to get a similar amount of points to another strategy that takes a bunch of energy in your brain working through and doing some really cool things. So the variance essentially made it much more expensive to go up this um, this uh, multiplier track for getting points for the Western Union. It just made it 10 times uh, as expensive, actually. Um, the second variant that I played with is you have these little goals that you're playing with in the game, and whenever you complete a goal, you will take a new one from a new stack. And in the rules, you're supposed to draw three from the top of the stack, but the official variant now is that you can just take the whole stack and just find the tile that you want and then do that one. So you have this extra race element of you want to get to that stack, you want to complete your um, your achievements first so you can get into that stack quickly and grab the one that's best for you before somebody else maybe comes in and grabs it for themselves. But then not only did I play with those two variants, I came up with a third variant, which is not an official variant, but it was my attempt to get around yet another negative that I had for the game that nobody's really talked about. And that is that one of the uh, two starting goals that you have in this game really feels imbalanced. Like it seems like some of them are just way easier to achieve than the others. And I thought about it a bunch. I looked at various um, secondary effects, like the color of the workers that you have to discard when you get that milestone and where those different things are out on the board. And I just could not come up with a way where this didn't seem like it was just unfair if you got one uh, an easy achievement versus a hard one. So I integrated these into the um, setup draft of getting your starting uh, uh, different colored workers as well as a starting bonus. I just put these four things out there so it was a new thing that you were able to, you were able to draft in when you were starting the game. So you had some control over whether or not you got the difficult one to grab, but it also had the best bonuses, uh, bo best bonus with the tile and the color person. Or you could maybe go for the really easy one, and maybe when I randomly shuffle those out, that the easy one is also going to be um, stuck next to a really good bonus. So there's only so much I can do with these little variants, but I feel like when I played with all three of these things together, I enjoyed the game much more. So uh, I'm not going to do a review revise just yet because I think I want to try them out a couple more times before I do that, but. For now, Railroad Revolution has gone up a notch or two in my book.
At game number four, we now have Panamax. This game came out a couple of years ago, and it is a heavy Euro-style game where you are controlling a corporation that is trying to actively send goods through the Panama Canal. You're going both different directions. There are four different regions that you are uh, that the ships are affiliated with. You have the uh, east coast of the U.S., you have the west coast of the U.S., you have China, and you also have Europe. And what you're doing in this game is a bit of uh, dice drafting, dice pool drafting from the middle of the table. You roll a bunch of dice, and then the values of the pips on the dice will let you do various things in different ways, as well as the location of the dice where you're going. And there are just a lot of different things going on here, and some really cool ideas where you are spatially pushing ships through the Panama Canal. And if you have a ship here and a ship here right in front of it, and you want to move this back one, it just moves the front one forward. So you are constantly incentivized to actually get your ships in front of other people's ships so that maybe they will move your ships for you as kind of free actions, essentially, because they might really want to move their stuff along and they might decide that it's still worth it to them to do that. And so there's a lot of kind of uh, begrudging back, back scratching going on in this game. And if that's all that Panamax was, I would really like it. I loved the dice pool drafting bit. That's a really great mechanic. I enjoyed the bumping boats around and like kind of managing all your boats that are out on the board. The issue that I had with it is the extra layer that this game added on of having stocks, where you have your own personal uh, pool of money, and then you are controlling a company that has its own pool of money. So each player has two different uh, pools of money, and certain things cost personal money, and certain things cost company money, and at the end of the game, you um, your points are the amount of personal money that you have at the end. And you can buy stocks in other uh, in your opponent's companies if you think maybe they have, they're have they more flush with cash than you are, and you're trying to manipulate the stocks that you have. And in general, when a game has a stock market um, a mechanism in, the, in it at all, I will automatically start to not like it as much. This is just a mechanism I do not enjoy very much in games. And so it's no surprise that in Panamax, I got pretty flustered and a bit annoyed as I was playing the game. Like I was really wanting to really like the game because I loved the boat uh, aspect and I love the dice. But just having that extra layer of trying to figure out, okay, spend this, this company money on this and personal money on that and figure out how you invest in this and how you invest in that. And it's also a rather tight game uh, where you have to do some math to make sure some things work out. I remember, I can't remember the specifics of what happened, but I was in a situation where I was one money away from doing a big thing. And because I didn't have that one money, it wasn't a neutral outcome. It was a very negative outcome. And I will admit, I think I whined a little bit as I was playing that game. I was trying not to, but it just seemed like all these unfortunate things were happening. And oh my gosh, I'm so out of it. And no, my opponents are doing so well. And then the game ended and I lost by two points. I came in second place and I and my, uh, the two people who came after me were like five points behind and then like 10 points behind. And I just kind of sat there kind of dumbfounded. Like, how did I do so well? Um, the, the, peop the people, two of the people who I'd played with had already played the game before. And it's just a weird situation to feel like you're not doing well, to feel like you don't have a great handle on all the mechanisms. And then suddenly almost win the game. And in fact, uh, if I think one of us had drawn a different card from one of the scoring st stacks, it would have easily flip-flopped. And that is another thing. You have this heavy Euro game where you're thinking about all sorts of stuff, but then you have these end game scoring cards, which can vary all over the place. I pulled one, I think it gave me like 15 points, and um, one of my opponents pulled one, and it gave him four points from the same stack, because it's just random from the top. And Obviously, if you try to pull these earlier in the game, you can work your uh, way around to try and make that scoring card do better for yourself. But it also seemed like near the end of the game, it was a good thing to do to try and push forward and grab one of these. And when you have the entire spread of points between first and last place be like 12-ish points, and then you have that kind of variance among the card pulls, that is a little worrisome to me. So this is obviously not a thorough review of the game. I've only played it once. I'm interested in trying it again, uh, but I don't see myself playing this one a third time. Uh, there's just a lot of stuff going on. I really want to love this game, but at the moment, I just kind of like it, and there's some things that really stick out to me that I don't like that much. Lastly, we have game number five, which is Veggie Garden, although I think I kind of talked myself out of the rankings on this one uh, just now by talking about Panamax. There were a couple more things that irked me uh, that I kind of remembered as I was talking, so that probably should have been number five, and Veggie Garden should probably have been number four, but either way, let's go ahead and talk about it. But before I say my opinion, I do want to mention that this was a game that I did a paid sponsored playthrough video for. I was not paid for my opinion in any way. There was no opinion in that video, but I still want to tell you what I thought of the game, but just... 
uh, go into it knowing that um, there was some sponsorship going on here. Uh, what you are doing in Veggie Garden is just cultivating collectively a 4x4 grid of vegetable cards in the middle of the table, but this is a competitive game that kind of has some stock market feels to it, but it is also a filler game. It plays very fast. You will take six turns and then the game will be over and that will probably take 15 to maybe 20 minutes even at the four player count because the turns are quite quick. You have this um, uh, face up row of vegetables in the middle of the table and on your turn you just pick one of them up and you will do an action that is associated with that specific vegetable. So if it is cabbage, then it's going to slide some rows around. If it's a carrot, then it lets the bunny hop from one fence post to another and then start eating whatever vegetable the bunny is right next to. And then the card that you picked that activated that ability will go into your hand. And at the end of the game, the, each of the vegetables will score a differing amount of points based on the values of the fence posts that they are next to. So as you're playing the game, you're trying to pick the vegetables that are good for the action that you want out on the board, but you're also investing in that vegetable type because at the end of the game, that card is going to be worth some variable number of points to you. And as you are actually managing things out on the board, you are obviously trying to push things in such a way that you will score the most points for your vegetables. But you're only going to do this six times, which is very quick. And also, you're paying attention to the cards that your opponents are taking, which means it's possible that you think that this person across from you is doing what you're doing, but maybe doing things slightly better. So you might be try you might try to work things so that your other vegetables that you know they don't have are going to be score scoring better than maybe the potatoes that both you and that person have the same amount of. Because at the end of the day, you want to have more points. So yeah, it's it's a neat little game. I've only played it um, outside of the playthrough with, with other people once, and I think the general consensus around the table was, huh, there was a little more there than I expected for such a tiny, simple game. And yeah, I think that's kind of where it's at. I'm not particularly excited to get this one out, but I could see myself um, pushing it occasionally when we have 15 to 20 minutes to kill um, at the beginning or the end of a game night, because there are um, some cool things to think about. Even though you're only making six decisions in the game, it's so quick that I figure that's actually fine. Also, it has this adorable, cutesy, fluffy art and everything. It's, it's a cute game in a cute little package. Next up, we have the Shifting Shelf segment, and this is simply all of the games that I acquired over the last month, and all of the games that I had to remove from my collection in order to make room for them. And for the second month in a row, I don't actually have any games leaving the collection because I sold so many games off in the live board game auction at uh, Endgame in Oakland that I had a bunch of holes on the shelf behind me. But if you look back there, there's not too many holes anymore. Well, I guess I pulled a couple games out as I was talking about them, but Either way, I think it's very likely there's going to be some games that are gone from the list next month due to um, uh, games that I've acquired, but also there is going to be the second flea market at Victory Point Games, uh, I'm sorry, Victory Point Cafe in downtown Berkeley, and I will have a booth there and I'm planning on selling some games off there. So you're certainly going to see some going away then, but for now, I want to talk about the 11 games that I got over this last month. Um, I will admit there was a bit of retail therapy going on here as I was working uh, quite hard over on this massive project um, that was kind of stressful and, you know, not making me the happiest person ever. There's something to be said for just going online, just buying a game and having it show up, even if I don't necessarily get it played in a timely manner. So let's go ahead and briefly talk about these. They're in alphabetical order, and the first one is Clank. Uh, I had this one in as a pre-order at a friendly local game store that I have some uh, some store credit with. It looks like a pretty cool game uh, where you are doing some uh, deck building and you're running throughout a dungeon, doing some push your luck, trying to grab as much treasure as you can and then run back out before the dragon wakes up and kills everybody, I guess. Uh, this one has pretty universal praise from lots of different people. I'm a bit behind the curve on this one, but I decided to uh, purchase it and give it a shot. I'm looking forward to giving that one a try. Uh, the next three are kind of like one game, and these are games in the Exit series. We have Exit, Abandoned Cabin, Pharaoh's Tomb, and Secret Lab. And all three of these are Escape the Room style games, sort of like Unlock that I already talked about in this uh, video. But the big difference here is, let's see, they're, they're right up there. The big difference here is that I'm pretty sure the rules are different for each of these games, and also I know there's destructive elements to it, so you cannot play these ones again uh, even by letting a friend borrow it. Obviously, games like Unlock, you can't play again either because you know how it'll go, but these ones, I think you're going to be cutting with scissors and folding and doing all sorts of crazy stuff, but I won't know until I crack, open the, crack them open, and I haven't opened any of them up yet, but I'm very excited to give those a shot. Now we have Fuji Flush. This is a really simple card game with just a deck of cards that have a variety of numbers on them. I mostly got this because it was at the friendly local game store that I have some store credit with, and I liked the idea of it. It's a very simple game, maybe too simple, but what you do on your turn is you just play a card from your hand, and the goal of the game is to get rid of all the cards that you have in your hand. And whenever um, you play a card, 
down. If you play the card that is a higher value than another card from somebody else who has out in front of them, then they have to discard that card and draw a new card into their hand. So they essentially tread water and don't lose any cards. But the thing that makes it special and not just, you know, whoever has the highest card wins is this kind of pseudo co-op thing going on where if uh, I put a two down and then the person next to me plays a two, then now our twos combine together and we both effectively have a four. So if the person after them plays a three, then our four is actually bigger. And if another person puts down a two, then all of us collectively have a six and we could collectively knock out um, that person who has a three, even though we all have twos, that three would then go away because six is collectively bigger than that. And then when that ha when it gets comes back around to you, if you still have a card in front of you because it wasn't kicked out, either because your card was really big or because it uh, summed up with all the other identical versions of that card to be big, then you could permanently get rid of it and just continue to lose cards in your hand. But I haven't actually played this game yet. Probably shouldn't have explained exactly how it uh, works in this brief overview. But either way, I'm looking forward to trying it. It looks simple, but not the most exciting thing in the world. Now we have Neuroshima Hex 3.0. This was sent to me by Portal Games because I'm going to be doing a... Uh, a spotlight marketing video for that game, so uh, it gets added into the collection. I used to own Nurishima 1.0 like seven years ago, and I enjoyed it then, so I'm looking forward to maybe giving this one a shot, seeing how things are a little bit different. It's a neat kind of game. Uh, I guess I should say what it's like. It's a, <laughs> it's a bit of a skirmish style where you have dudes on a map, and I normally don't like that, but the map is really tiny, and there's some pretty cool actions that go on, and they, for the most part, don't move, so it's more of an aggressive tie-line game. Either way, it's got some neat stuff going on. Uh, now we have number nine, which I've already talked about at reasonable length in the Games of Note segment. It's a cool tile land game. And now we have Quinto the Card Game, or Das Kartenspiel, because this one was yet another one I grabbed from Amazon.de because it only came out in German. And this is a card game version of Quinto, which is a neat push-your-luck dice, uh, roll-and-write dice style game. Uh, I've done a full review of Quinto. I think it's actually a really cool game that I don't get played very much, very often, and I really like the idea of the card game version. It uses the exact same pads, but instead of rolling dice, you now have some more control over your destiny by actually playing cards down to dictate what the color options are and what the number options are. I haven't played this one yet, but I'm looking forward to giving it a shot. I haven't heard the best things about it from other reviewers, but it was like $8, so I had to give it a go. Now we have... Uh, Tiny Epic Games Beyond the Black expansion. Um, I did a full playthrough of this one, and I, I don't think I backed it on Kickstarter, but I got a version of it from Gambling Games, I think, as a thank you for doing the playthrough video. Uh, I really enjoyed Tiny Epic uh, Galaxies. It's a cool push-your-luck dice rolling game with some engine building going on, and the expansion really does add some neat stuff with asymmetric ship powers and uh, yet another way you could push your luck. This game does not get played all that often, but I do want to try and combine these together and have it hit the table occasionally because there's some pretty cool stuff going on here, especially at lower player counts because downtime can be a bit of a thing at higher ones. Uh, now we have The Banishing. So this one, I have heard almost nothing about. It was published by WizKids, which is a somewhat large publisher, and the only people I've heard say anything about this game is uh, the Dukes of Dice podcast, and they've mentioned it a couple times um, just in passing, like, oh, I played The Banishing again. Yeah, it's still fun, and oh, people keep playing The Banishing at our friendly local game store. And I remember hearing that and saying, what the heck is The Banishing? Um, how have I not heard about this in any of the hype machine that I pay constant attention to? So I looked it up online, and yeah, it just came out a month or two ago. It's a cooperative game with a neat puzzly style thing going on with cards in the middle of the table where you have to take a row or a column, and there are a ton of asymmetric uh, characters in there. So yeah, I'm looking forward to giving this one a shot. It looks like a pretty neat package. And lastly, we have Unlock, and I've talked about that one a reasonable amount already. I've already essentially completed that game, so I played three segments of it, and I hope there will be more versions, more scenarios that come out for Unlock in the future. But that wraps up all of the uh, games I purchased over this last month, and this wraps up the overall vlog. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed uh, everything I've talked about, especially the uh, one-off segment where I discussed the top 20 games on BoardGameGeek. Hopefully that wasn't too derivative and you picked up something interesting there. I'm certainly looking forward to uh, June more than May because work is a little bit more normal. I'm going to have a lot more days off so that I can uh, get more videos out, which will certainly uh, make me feel better because I do enjoy making this stuff. There's a fun sense of accomplishment and uh, progression as I get videos out. And to a certain degree, it's hard not to gamify everything, including the number of views and subscribers that I get on this channel. It's just cool to see that stuff go up, and it certainly took a dip over this last month. So either way, I really hope you enjoyed this vlog, and I hope you enjoy everything that's to come over the next month. As always, I'd like to thank everyone who's been supporting this channel, including all of these producer-level pledges. If you too would like to directly support the channel, you could do so at patreon.com slash and I'd really appreciate it. 
Also, if you'd like to see more of these monthly vlogs, as well as in-depth board game reviews and playthroughs, please subscribe to the channel. Thanks for watching.